So there's still quite a few of you here. That's kind of amazing. Um, you guys are, you know, the last of the Mohegans, the diehards, to stick with the program all day long. Wow, it's kind of rare. But I'm glad you're here. Uh, we're going to be talking about, as you can see, love, sex, and marriage. I mean, what an irony that my daughter shows up right at that moment, and it's the last thing on earth she wants me to talk about in public. So anyway, it just happened that way. I didn't plan it. But there is a, an interest here, because we were talking about dating, courtship, that type of stuff, on the way here, and you guys said that you wanted to talk more about it, learn more about it, so um, not to embarrass everyone, but we won't do anything terribly embarrassing here, because I don't talk about um, anatomy, I talk about brain chemistry, you see, so that's how you get around the, the squeamish factor when you're talking about sexuality, you should just talk about what happens in the brain. So um, let's, let's pray, because I still need help. <laughs> Dear God, thank you so much for your love and your goodness to us and your plan for us. We've seen so far today that you're very, very ingenious in your orchestrating human experience to teach us how to love and be loved in so many different ways. One of the more complicated and difficult ways in which we love is marriage. It's probably the hardest thing most of us have ever attempted. And so we're going to be looking at various aspects of that and also at some other facets of love, such as love within the family of God in the church. And uh, help me to just tie all these thoughts together. We're all kind of tired at this point, Lord, but we ask that your spirit would step in and fill in for where humanity fails. Thank you for the gift of music. Thank you for Alice, Allison's ministry. We ask you to bless her and strengthen her and, um, and provide for her as she ministers for you. And please bless our meeting now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what did you, what, what resonated with you from what I've shared so far today? What, what just really stuck with you? Just kind of give me some feedback here. Just randomly, just blurt out whatever you liked or thought of. What's that? You like the fact that I talked about babies being fat and how that had a purpose? Just share whatever you know, impressed you or whatever was meaningful to you and what I've shared so far today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. yeah, and everything begins and ends with that kind of love. Amen. Good. Yes. Keeping, uh huh. Uh huh. Which is it that? Yes. yes. Yeah. That's good. Zeroing in on the experience of God and trying to understand what He what He went through. Even God and we're finite beings, we can still to at least try to understand. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Things that impressed you? Meaningful to you? Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, 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 we are. Most exclusive family in the universe. And he sacrificed being part of that family. So he could be part of the family. It's, it, it, it'll take a long time for us to understand if we ever do. So, Anybody else? What was impressive or what was meaningful to you that I've shared so far today? Any other comments? Go ahead. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I might get an argument from some from the seminary on that one. I don't know. I to me it seems at least plausible. Oh. But um you know at any rate, in the New Testament, we do have clear triadic passages that mention all three members of the Godhead. So, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Anything? Go ahead. Joel. Besides the power source, the guiding principle it keeps us in form so that we can carry. Mm -hmm. Very good. Excellent. All right. So, we've looked at the sort of life journey of a human being according to God's plan for human development. And we've seen that at every stage, we're acquiring certain skills or, or capabilities and experience that prepares us for the next stage. So we started out with infancy, the relationship between the mother and child, and then we went to father and child, and then what was next? Siblings, and then what was after siblings? Everything is practiced for the next stage. So what's after siblings? friendship and we learned some things about friendship well when you're in the friendship phase of your life you're really practicing for the best friend you'll ever have which is a life partner because if you think about it the characteristic or the quality of that relationship is really a friendship with a little bit of romance thrown in it's not like it's always romantic all the time for the rest of your life but there is a very solid friendship there and so the skills we acquire in the friendship phase of life really serve us well in the life partnership phase of life, and we want to talk about that for the next few minutes. So one of the cool things about uh, marriage is that we move from passion to compassion in marriage. And there's actual neuroscience involved in this. During the initial phases of a romantic relationship, of course, there's a lot of passion. And there's a lot of lovemaking, and I don't want to get too technical here and freak my daughter out, but, or freak anybody out, but there's a lot of chemistry that goes on in that process that actually prepares the mind for deep attachment. And it's, it's kind of creating a seedbed where the roots of attachment can grow very deep. So my point is that the chemistry that's involved in sexuality is supposed to ultimately serve the process of bonding. And unfortunately, often we have sexual experiences with people with whom we do not have a long-term relationship with. We human beings just go outside of God's plan all the time, and, and we experience the chemistry of bonding without the actual relationship of bonding, and it leads to a lot of painful detachment breakups and leaving people behind and so forth. This is very, very hard on the human psyche because there are certain chemicals that are saying, let's bond forever, let's be a, a pair together forever. And then there's, because you haven't created that stability in that relationship, it's not a viable relationship, you end up parting ways and that leads to a lot of pain. But let's look at that in the reverse. God it has a function to passion, and it's not just about the passion itself, it's about building compassion or long-term attachment into that relationship. And that's why God is so protective of sexuality. So I have a diagram or a picture here of a barbed wire fence. Think of the prohibitions in scripture on human sexuality, and face it, there are a lot of them. We look in the Bible and we see very strong limitations on human sexual expression in scripture. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed how sharply it contrasts with the spirit of the world, which says, you know, if it feels good, do it. Anything goes. You know, if you love someone in that moment, it's fine. Whatever, wherever your heart leads you, follow your heart and this kind of thing. The Bible is in sharp contrast to that and has very strong, definitive parameters on human sexuality. And sometimes it can seem like God's kind of a killjoy. Like God is kind of trying to take the fun out of life, you know? But those restrictions are like a barbed wire fence before a drop-off, much kinder than they seem on the future, on, on, on the, uh, much kinder than they seem on the surface, sorry. Some people look at those restrictions on human sexuality in scripture and assume that God hates sex, but nothing could be further from the truth because God actually uses 
the married relationship to describe his relationship to his church. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And he says, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. We read in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door, you can say it with me, and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. These words directly reflect a passage in Song of Solomon. That is a book that is considered, was considered so erotic that Jewish boys were not allowed to read it until they were 30 years old. And so we see the, the sort of the origin of Revelation 3.20 that we just recited in Song of Solomon chapter 5 and verse 2. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. This is very romantic, erotic language. Really what's happening is the woman opens the door, the man enters. It's very, I'm sorry, but it's a very sexual overtone in these, in these passages. But that's a beautiful thing. And my point is this, that God considers sex to be holy. He's not embarrassed. He's not turned off or, or disgusted by it. He doesn't think it's shameful or dirty. He thinks it beautiful. In fact, he created it. But, but like with everything God creates, the enemy of God is very anxious to take it out of its course and to deviate from it. And so I want to talk for the next few moments about what happens on a neurological level with human sexual experience, and you'll see that there's one of two ways we can experience sexuality. We can experience it according to God's plan, and if we experience it according to God's plan, it's going to lead to bonding, and it's going to lead to lasting happiness and all kind of good things. If we experience it outside of God's plan, it's going to lead to all kinds of destruction and difficulty. So I want to look at two main chemicals, brain chemicals, that mediate human sexuality. One is dopamine, which is a pleasure neurotransmitter, and the other is oxytocin, which is a bonding hormone. Can you, um, can you bring, I'm, I'm losing this thing, it's like falling, so could you bring me another, um, could you bring me another, thanks. Someone? This is falling. This one right here, it's good. I think that one's stronger. Okay, so dopamine is a pleasure neurotransmitter, oxytocin is a bonding hormone. And those two things kind of do a little dance with each other in human sexuality, and it's important that they're both part of the dance. Let's look at dopamine first. Dopamine, of course, is a pleasure neurotransmitter. God has given each one of us a reward-seeking system. We're all driven toward something that we want to achieve or acquire. We want to achieve this reward, and God has put that system in us, and ultimately it was designed to lead us to him. But the thing is, the devil, because it ultimately leads us to God, the devil is trying to get it out of its course. And so he's always trying to draw us away through that pleasure-seeking system. And the reality is that some pleasures tend to overload the system. So too much dopamine, which is the pleasure neurotransmitter, will override satiation mechanisms in the brain. There's something called delta Fos B that accumulates in the reward circuits of the brain. And this causes a numbing of the pleasure response. So more of the stimulant is required to produce the same high. That's called desensitization. What does it sound like to you when I'm describing this? It sounds like drug addiction, doesn't it? But here's the thing, is that you can actually become addicted to naturally occurring opiates. Here's a statement from Tim Clinton in a wonderful book called The God Attachment. He says, the brain develops a tolerance for naturally occurring opiates. Notice the opa in dopamine. Very similar to opiate. Dopamine is a naturally occurring opiate. So you actually have a little bit of a heroin junkie in your brain. <laughs> And you can become addicted to the, to the dopamine that your own brain produces. 
through excess, through overeating, through too much sex or the wrong kind of sex, we can become addicted to sex. We can become addicted to gambling. We can become addicted to things that all they do is they trigger the opiate response in the brain. We call them process addictions. Unfortunately, this can happen to human beings and it can lead to a lot of difficulty. But the good news is that within God's plan, the same dopamine response will be a good thing. So it says, though dopamine may be the hormone that creates the instinctive pleasure of love and attachment, it is oxytocin that makes it possible for that pleasure to last for longer periods of time. So dopamine is responsible for pleasure. Oxytocin is responsible for bonding. If you have a bonded relationship in place and there is a close, intimate attachment, you will actually enjoy the experience of dopamine for a longer period of time. Here it is in biblical language. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are what? Pleasure. Does God have something against pleasure? No. Absolutely not. He wants you to have pleasure forevermore. He wants you to have that dopamine rush for a longer period of time. And that's why he says experience sex within a bonded relationship because it will last for a longer. You will have more pleasure in the end because of it. So if we look at the big picture of keeping sexuality within the parameters that are laid down for us in scripture, what we see is that sex within marriage is rated 15% better. People actually enjoy their sex life better if it's within boundaries. People have better marriages if they wait for marriage, if they keep sex for the marriage relationship. They're going to have 22% higher stability, 20% higher satisfaction, 12% better communication. They're going to have better health, better mental health, and the story continues. We just do better as human beings when we stay within God's parameters. I'm doing a lot of study now on human sexuality. I'm going to be taping a series of shows for life and health, a little 10-minute videos, and I'm going to address everything. I'm going to address homosexuality, transgenderism, <coughs> uh, pornography addiction, all of the various aspects of sexuality, and I solicit your prayers on that because it's a difficult subject. But it's part of our health, isn't it? And uh, we're supposed to be all about public health and ministering to people and their health. And we haven't said a whole lot about sexuality, but it's a public health issue. So I feel we need to. So let's talk about how to form that partnership. You know, there was a book that came out about maybe 20 years ago called I Kiss Dating Goodbye that really made the rounds in Christian circles. How many of you have read that book or heard about it? Okay. So I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up in, quote, unquote, the world. And so I dated in high school the way you date in the world and had my experiences out there, so to speak. Then I became a Seventh-day Adventist, and I joined a very conservative ministry that didn't allow dating. What they did allow was courtship, but courtship was only under the approval of the leadership, and it was very carefully controlled. And it's kind of like we went from one extreme to the other, where people would be virtual strangers. I remember one couple, a friend of mine, was courting a man, and uh, they had their courtship, and they did everything just by the book. And as they're driving away from their wedding, he put his arm around her, and she looked at him and thought to herself, I hope he's not hoping to get physical with me. You know, I mean, I hope he's not thinking that that's going to be part of this relationship. You know, we kind of went from one extreme to the other, where we just <laughs> were really uh, in a state of disconnect. So this book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, became very popular, and many of us, um, I know, can you believe it? Many of us thought it was a great idea, and I think it was an improvement on generic dating, because generic dating could sometimes lead to people getting overly involved emotionally, physically, and then getting broken hearts. And so I Kiss Dating Goodbye presented a more restrained view of how to approach relationships, and it was an improvement, I think. But there were some issues with it. For one thing, people would go almost from not even knowing each other straight into courtship, and courtship was so serious that it was almost like engagement. So people would go from a completely sheltered life, some of them that took it really to the next level, right into like almost an engagement situation. And when you're engaged, it's a big thing to call off an engagement. So people would feel pressured to marry and they'd end up marrying a virtual stranger. 
So there were some issues involved with the I kiss dating goodbye approach, the courtship approach, and I understand that Joshua Harris himself has had second thoughts about it. So I've given it some thought and I've boiled the process. Not that you can ever say exactly how a courtship should take place, because to me, if you make it a rigid process, you're really taking the life out of it. It's supposed to have some fluidity to it, and it's supposed to be kind of a creative, wonderful thing. And so, you know, I don't want to overregulate it, but here are the three basic steps that I, I have been able to break it down to. Number one, friendship dating. I think we should have such a thing as friendship dating. The great generation did a, a type of dating where people weren't serious. They weren't going steady. They weren't thinking about being in a relationship. They would just date. And what they would do is they'd go places that were relatively public and they wouldn't date the same person over and over and over because that meant you were going what? You were going steady. So they would just date to get to know people. And I think we need to do that, especially in this transient age. We need to have an opportunity to spend alone time with people so that we can get to know them. But we need to do it in such a way that we're not tempted to overbond with that person, either physically or emotionally before we're ready to make a commitment to that individual. So friendship dating, I think, is a step that we've um, missed out on. And then if in the process of friendship dating and getting to know a variety of people, you decide that one of that, those individuals is a really a potential partner, then you get into a serious dating or courting relationship, if you want to call it that. Although when I hear courtship, I always think of men in tights and women in pointed hats. So I think we need to come up with a, another term. But anyway, serious dating comes along. And then finally, engagement, where you're committed to marry that individual. I think this is a good way to break down the process. Uh, there are three basic questions that I would encourage people to ask. Number one, am I ready for marriage? Between you and God, are you ready? Are you mature enough for marriage? If you don't know the answer to that question, ask your friends. Chances are they'll be honest with you. And ask your parents and ask your spiritual mentors, and ask a variety of people, do you think that I'm ready for marriage? If enough people say no, then you need to go back to the drawing board, but if they say yes, then that's the first question. The second question is, are they ready for marriage? This potential partner, are they mature enough to be in this relationship? But even if both of you are mature enough, that doesn't mean you're what? Compatible. So if you want to spend your life in Peru, ministering to the indigenous people, and your potential partner wants to be a brain surgeon and wants to go to school at, in Harvard Medical School or something, it's probably not a match if you have totally different life plans. So be somewhat realistic and practical about planning your lives together. Now I want to give you guys a chance to ask questions. I know that this is a pressing issue for you, particularly at your age. Um, any of you want to just fire some questions away or comments? No? Go ahead. We were kind of talking about this on the, in the car on the way here, but I don't think you were in the car. I have good questions. I just can't think of them right now. Okay, that's all right. Okay. The problem I have with friendship dating okay. is that the lines are not clear. Mm -hmm. If it's not clearly communicated, you can end up with people with broken hearts because they're like, well, I thought we were dating. And the other one's like, <laughs> We're just oh, friends. <laughs> we were just hanging out. And that happens a lot nowadays. Like, it's very common, especially in offense dudes, for guys to be like, yeah, I'm just hanging out with her. And then all of a sudden, she got all, like, crazy. And she wanted to date me. And so I'm like, whoa. You know? <laughs> so, like, I don't know if there's a way to, hey, what's friendship date? I don't know. <laughs> well, what about, what about having the relationship conversation where you say, well, what can we? Creepy. Trying to get too serious. Well, okay, but that, but to me, that is a cultural issue, and we need to build the culture to where we can have those conversations. We need to be honest about the potential for people getting hurt. Yeah, or just having a conversation where you say, you know, I'm just making sure, you know, th this is just a friendship, right? I mean, that's how you see it. That's how I see it. Are you good with that? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be an awkward conversation, but you either have awkward conversations. Well, maybe give us, give us like a little spiel that we can say. You want me to give you a spiel? I mean, you should. I think 
I think you should give me a spiel. <laughs> no, because I think a lot of people, when they get in that situation, like it's time to have that talk, it comes out all awkward and wrong. Yeah. So maybe there's like role play. Yeah, yeah. mom. Like, all right, let's do it. Give us like a, okay. a nice little sentence. All right, let's let's say you and I are dating. <laughs> So, so Allison, you know, we've been spending some time together, and this is always kind of, a, kind of an awkward conversation to have, but I just want to make sure, you know, I see this as a friendship. I want to make sure, do you see it that way too, or? Wait, no, you no? can't say okay. that, because that okay. just sounds like we're just friends. Friend zone. Friend zone. What? What's wrong with, friend yeah, you're friend zoning friend the person. Zone. Like, you end off all possibility of Yeah, so that's like, we're not. All right, well, what about, what if I were to say, um, like, so at this point, we're just friends, right? I mean, no, we're that's also no. Friends, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what has really helped me is different things is that we, you go as a group. Yeah. If you yeah. go as a group and yeah. make friends with other mm -hmm. people, that's less friends. That's just regular friends. And then the common ground is we're all friends. And then you watch each other. It's really more beneficial. Right. 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 And I have other people that have done this, and they really find it and so that's yeah. much less yeah. if you go in the groups. And that's just... Well, okay, but we're having a little struggle up here with that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just going to say this, like, because that... No offense. You guys are great people. No offense. But it's just like... It's like it defeats the purpose of, like... Getting to know that person when you're one on one, yeah. And so it's just like, whoa! Like, are you like putting like new wine into old barrels or something like that? And so it's just like, oh, yeah. how is this gonna work? But I'm just saying, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, we're I, we're saying that there. I, I'm saying that there's a point where it's a good thing to get to know someone individually before you get into a serious dating relationship. Because if you're going to seriously date someone, yeah, but but that's what I'm talking about. But with friendship dating, you're actually spending time with the individual, purposely trying to get to know them. So there's friendship, then friendship dating, then actual dating, then courtship. Very good. There's phases, exactly. Yeah. 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 What I observed, and obviously it's just anecdotal, I'm observing my, my son more than anything, is both of them, and maybe it's just their genetics and the, where they come from, but the attention when they, at, at younger ages, when they got attention from young ladies, they, uh, it, in some cases, it was obvious to me that the attention meant more to my son than it did to the ladies. <laughs> Although it was obvious, you know, they were giving them attention because of, you know, there was an interest in them. Right. But it wasn't... So you think that boy, the, you think that males and females uh, um, respond differently to these I, I various situations? Okay. Okay. Maybe I don't. I, I. Yeah. Maybe. Perhaps. But she gave the example of the man thinking he was just being a friend, and the woman gets serious. So I think it, it kind of goes either both ways. Yeah. Maybe. Well, younger males. Well, I should preface this by saying I don't think you should do any kind of dating until you're mature enough, until males and females are basically equal in maturity, which tends to be farther down the road in the 20s. And by the way, your brain isn't even fully developed until your mid-20s, so I think it's better to, yeah, yeah. What, what's that? I don't think there's too many of these young folks that are close How old are you guys? 25, 20, yeah, they're between 20 and 25, so they're getting there. They're almost cooked. Yeah. Yeah? 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. And over 50 years, over 50 years, I ran a, a, a boy yeah. camp in Estacado, Oregon. Okay. And I prayed for wife because I came back from being a call porter pilot in Alaska. And I was praying for wife. And I had a home. You were praying for a wife, you said? The vocational skill of a little boy. But came back to it. What does a young man have to offer? The young lady. Yeah. A lot of death. Yeah. And the other thing is. Well, wait, wait a minute. You're. Capacity where 20,000 yeah. people were, and certainly there was 250 girls yeah. uh, of marriageable age. Right. But I was in the back bedroom of my folks' place praying with an older man that God would give me the right companion. Right. I knew that night that yeah. Diane Merrill uh -huh. was going to be my wife. Okay. Why? Because she believed in the health message that these bodies are a temple of God. Yeah. She worked at Big Lake Youth okay. Camp, yeah. loved young people, and That's good. Uh, it, it was you just knew. Side yeah. of it that yeah. attracted us. Yeah. And when that girl said, no, Mom, Dad, in college friends, I'm not coming back to find a husband. The girl, the nurse in yeah. the Philippines, he's going to just flat have to come out of the sky. Yeah. And he did. He came down the helicopter because they couldn't build runways in there. So uh, I'm saying, let's not break the rules and think the outcome because I'm an old pilot and uh, all the air searches and you need helicopters. Why wasn't that me? Okay. And I have had ears, I've had eight airplanes come apart. I am detailed. Yeah, but we're, you're getting on kind of some tangents here, so we're going to try to keep it focused. <laughs> Okay. Uh, if that if they can accomplish more for God's name. Sure. And that that's basic. Amen. Go ahead. I'm getting on in years, and uh, my observation, the gentleman back here says maybe anecdotal, but I believe that men operate on hormones the first thirty years of their life, and intellectually after the first thirty after the first thirty. I love how you've broken this down. Uh, am I ready for marriage? Are they ready for marriage? Are we compatible? These are important questions that each individual needs to ask themselves because so often, I didn't marry until I was 30, but I, I look back in my life at my friends that, well, I was drafted for Vietnam. They mm -hmm. went on to school and they got married to their high school sweetheart. They had never dated anybody but walked on campus and whatnot, thought they were in love. And as I go back to my reunions, not one of them, not one of them is married to the same person that they married when they left school. Yeah, that's unfortunate. They were not ready. Right. So often, so often there is this this fear that kind of creeps. I think I can speak for myself into a single man that. So I went away for two two years in the military. When I came back, my peers had finished college, and. All the eligible girls were married. Does that mean that I'm going to be alone the rest of my life? And on, on the reverse side, young ladies see their girlfriends getting married, and they say, am I going to be an old spinster the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. And they marry the first person yeah. that shows them some attention. And yeah. both, of those, both of those situations wind up a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. Do you guys have any questions or comments? Go ahead. I'm still like rehearsing the question. <laughs> okay. Okay. So like, say if you're friendship dating someone, and then like, I or they yeah. decide that, okay, maybe like they're not potential. Like, if we both know we're friendship dating, like, and I like split off, and like I notice they're not potential. Like, how do you like communicate? Like, hey, I still want to be here. Friend, friend, but I don't want to friendship dating. Well, I wouldn't. I I don't see friendship dating as a super formal thing. I don't see it as a committed relationship. What I'm saying is, it's it's spending time with a variety of other single people to get to know them on an individual basis. And I'm saying that that spending time should be as much as possible in a public situation, 
so that you're not tempted to overbond physically or emotionally. And it should be a variety, not with that same, no, I'm not friendship dating Joe for six months. I'm friendship dating Joe and then Tom and then Bob, and I'm doing it all in a public context or even a group context, you know, spending a little bit of time having an individual conversation so that I can get to know them. My point is get to know a variety of people, learn how to conduct yourself with the opposite sex and get to know them as friends before you get into a super serious relationship, a committed relationship. So there's no reason to break up a friendship dating because it's not a steady relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So do you guys all understand what I'm saying here? Friendship dating is simply getting to know a wide variety of other single people in the appropriate context that is unlikely to cause overbonding physically or emotionally. And Allison brought up a very good point. Regular friendship. Maybe a little bit. But and it necessitates a serious talk about there has to be a relationship conversation at some point about the nature of your relationship. And you have to say, and you didn't like me saying, I see this as a friendship, because as you guys said, that's friend zoning a person. But I think you have to say, and it's going to be awkward no matter how you say it, but you have to say something along the lines of, how do you see this relationship? This is the way I see it. So I don't know how you can, can do that. You're not going to say to the person, how do you see this relationship, and not offer how you see it, because that would be putting them on the spot. So you, I think you kind of have to say, hey, I see this as a friendship for now. Is that how you see it? Yeah. No. Listen, people get really hurt when they don't have honest conversations about stuff like this. You know, it's they're awkward and they're difficult, but there is no way to take the risk for hurt feelings and awkwardness out of this process. So let's not be dogmatic about it. I'm not being dogmatic and in, in, you know I'm trying to present something here, but Let's, let's, you know, go ahead. I'm wondering, you mentioned you know, that you should have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with people trying to get to know, get to know them better one-on-one um, -on -one without being in a situation that would risk, like, overbonding. Right. And I'm wondering if you might elaborate, other than being in a public setting, what would be some suggestions to help walking help not overbond? in a more public, you know, on a public road? Um, walking, you know, I remember when you guys were at Bogenhofen, you used to take walks with some of your friends and stuff, and you know, you developed friendships. And but it was all out in the open; it wasn't like you'd go off in the woods and be alone, you know. You didn't have the friendship dating talk, and I think you, I think you could have used it in a couple of situations, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, um, but yeah, walking, I would say, is pretty safe if you're out on an open road. Um, you know, being in a more of a, um, you know, if you're on a campus kind of thing, you know, spending some time alone chatting with someone on a table when other people are in the cafeteria or whatever. I think that that kind of thing is necessary and helpful. Okay, are your feelings based on a fantasy about them and you don't really know them? Because that would be excellent to get to know them because it might pop, the, you know, put a pin to the balloon, you know, type of thing. It might deflate your overinflated ideas of them. Um, so it can be a very good thing, I think, to get to know someone in an authentic context without bonding with them, without getting over involved. And, you know, guys, this is the thing you're not animals. You're human beings made in the image of God, and you can have boundaries. You can have emotional boundaries and physical boundaries, and you can still get to know people. I don't like the philosophy that says never be alone with anyone because you'll immediately fall in love and just rip each other's clothes, you know, this kind of thing. It's just, you're, you're, you're made in the image. I know you're young and hormone-loaded, but you can still control yourselves. Absolutely. That's what I'm talking about. That's kind of what I mean when I say friendship dating. Although, 
because we're in a very transient society, we don't always have a situation where we're with other young people, and sometimes we have to be intentional about getting to know someone. And I'm just saying we should be able to get to know them without having to make a commitment to be in a serious dating relationship with them, because that to me is premature if you don't even know them yet. So, okay, so um, quickly. Yeah. Like a, uh, like a ten year old daughter holds her hand. Right. It's there is no way yeah. two people who are friendship dating could make holding hands the same innocent touch as me holding my hand and holding hands with my daughter walking down the street. No, I agree. And I I mean that's I'm not that's yeah. a, a So not not recommending getting holding hands with a friend. Kind of, any yeah. Kind of real right. Intimate touch. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Between uh, between a young man and a young woman, I totally agree. Would you guys agree with that? I mean, you don't hold hands with your opposite sex friends, so that would, would be weird. So okay, quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah? Good. All right, I'll tell you a little story, and then I'm going to close out because it's 8 o'clock. I was doing a training similar to the one that I'm doing here about three or four months ago in another state. There was a young man who had tried to come to the training before. He was interested in becoming a counselor. He tried to come to the training before, didn't make it, and he was determined to come this time, but his car broke down. He had to replace his battery. It was a big struggle. And then once he got there, he did couch surfing to find a place to stay. And, but he was in the line of duty. This guy was determined to follow God's lead in getting this training because he was interested in counseling and interested in ministry. The hosting couple happened to have a lovely daughter. And we all kind of got into the living room at the end of the training and so we're sitting in the living room and all of a sudden I look back and forth between this young man and this lovely daughter and I'd never seen it before, never thought of it before, but I realized they'd make, because I know both of them pretty well, perfect couple. You know, I just thought, this, this is amazing. Did they even know each other before this weekend? They didn't know each other before that weekend. What happened was he was very interested in her and began to reach out to her and, and try to make friends with her. She was not interested at all. However, she became convinced that she was supposed to go through this book, 40 Days of Prayer, and it wasn't the Adventist book, it was a different book, and she was convinced that God wanted her to go through this 40 Days of Prayer with someone else. She asked a friend of hers, a friend wasn't interested at all, and this young man, I think asked her, would you go through it with me? Or maybe he didn't even ask her, but God convinced her. At any rate, they ended up doing the 40 days of prayer. She has no interest in him romantically. He's very interested in her romantically. And they start going through on the phone this 40 days of prayer together. And through the course of that 40 days of prayer, she fell head over heels in love with him. And pretty soon I see these things on Facebook, the two of them with their cheeks together and and then the next thing is he proposed, and now they're engaged. And I'm like, and they're older, you know, they're in their late 20s kind of thing. And I, I'm just like shocked. And I said, you guys met at my training, right? Yeah. And I said, I'm taking full credit for this. This is really <laughs> awesome. But what happened, I asked her, what was the point where your heart turned? And this is often the case that the man is more in pursuit of the woman than the other way around. And, and I said, at what point did your heart change toward him? And she said, when he prayed. There's something about the way that he prayed that just really... 
And I guess uh, when he proposed, it was this amazing thing where he had this room filled with like, it was like 500 candles or something. And it was just, it was very amazing. So um, they're engaged now. So that's a, that's a beautiful story of how God can orchestrate a relationship. Like this man was in the line of duty. He went to my training for spiritual training. He wanted to be more effective in ministry. And he met the love of his life in the process of that. So you stay with God's program for your life. And it will naturally lead you to people that are compatible with you. And then God will continue to orchestrate through that. And, and he will lead you to, to the person that he wants for you, if it is indeed his will. So I want to end with one very deep spiritual thought. I'm going to have to fast forward here. I was going to talk about some other things, but I'm not going to have time. But I do want to talk in closing about the love that underpins everything. You know, our relationships, our human relationships are only as successful as we allow that love of God to pour out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That love that I was talking about this morning. The Old Testament equivalent of agape is chesed. It's a word that sounds like you're about to spit on the person in front of you. Chesed. Say it. Chesed. It's a beautiful word that is so weighty in meaning that it is interpreted many, many, many different ways. And here are just a number of the interpretations. Mercy, unfailing love, steadfast love, faithful love, loving kindness. All of God's covenants that we see throughout the Bible are led by his chesed love. Chesed is basically God keeping his promises to us even when we fail to keep our promises to him. Chesed is a love that acknowledges that God is the big one in his relationship with us. We are not the big one. God is the big one. He's the pursuer. He's the one that's coming after humanity, laying down his life for humanity, and then gradually winning us over. And I want to just talk about that love for a moment here so that it gives us a sense of, of what it means to us as individuals. I think if I were to boil down what makes God's love different than human love, it would be that one trait of self-giving. And in the context of sin, self-giving becomes self-sacrifice. You know, love hurts sometimes. There's no way to love and be loved on this earth without experience, experiencing some kind of sacrifice. So I just wanted to end with that thought. Um, did you know that... The Dark Knight Massacre, which is this shooting that occurred in a movie theater, the Batman movie, I think it was, this gunman came in 2012 and he mowed down a bunch of people. Did you know that the, there were three women whose boyfriends were with them in the movie theater who covered their girlfriends with their bodies and saved their lives and lost their own in the process? Three boyfriends. And here you see all three of them. You know, Paul says an amazing thing in Romans chapter 5. He says, it says, Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is believed that Paul is referring to an ancient myth. And let me tell you the myth very briefly here. It's a Greek myth. Greek thought was very common in Paul's day. And so sometimes he would reference commonly known myths. This was the myth of Admetus and Alcestis. Admetus was a man who fell in love with a beautiful princess named Alcestis. And he wanted to win her hand in marriage, but her father said, no, no, no. Nobody can have her unless the man comes in a chariot drawn by lions and boars. No, nobody has a chariot like that. Except Admetus had a favor coming to him from the Greek god Zeus. And so he went to Zeus and said, can you work me up this chariot drawn by lions and boars? And no, I'm sorry, it was Apollo. And Apollo made it happen. So Admetus won the hand of his beautiful princess Alcestis. Soon after the marriage, he's trying to enjoy his new life. He finds he has a terminal illness and he's not going to live but a very short time. And he goes back to Apollo and says, can you spare my life? And Apollo says, you're going to have to find someone to die in your place. So according to this popular myth, it was very popular in Paul's day, 
Admetus went to his aging parents, will you die for me? No, they wouldn't do it. He went to his slaves. He said, will you die for me? They wouldn't do it. He went to, from person to person. Nobody would die for him. He went to bed that night in despair. Couldn't find anyone to die in his place. But he woke up the next morning in perfect health. And he sprang from his bed, anxious to tell his lovely Alcestis. And he found her dead. She had been willing to lay down her life for the man she loved. And in that context, with that myth in mind, Paul said, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. Rarely will human love lay down its life for another, but once in a while we will find someone that's that sacrificial that will lay down their lives for the one that they love, for the one that they deem worthy. And that was the case with these three boyfriends who were willing to lay down their lives, make the ultimate sacrifice for their girlfriends whom they deemed so worthy and so attractive. But then he goes on and he says, but God commends his love toward us in, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the very best of human love lays down its life for the girlfriend, but God's love lays down his life for that guy in the corner. And friends, I want to leave you with this thought. It's a very important thought. You need to focus on that love, that love that loves the very worst, the very most worldly, the very most lost, and the very most given over to sin. You need to focus on that love because that guy, there's a little bit of him in each one of us. And the only way that God's love is going to sink down into the substrata of our souls is if we focus on his love for that guy so that we will finally get that he even loves us when we're like that guy, okay? And that's what will make us secure in our salvation so that when we go to people, we won't be coming from a place of poverty. We'll be coming from a place of abundance, sharing good news with them rather than sharing our fear and spreading more fear-based religion. We need to have security, the appropriate kind of security in Jesus that's based on his unfailing and unfathomable love. Can I get an amen from you? Amen. And that love will inform all of our relationships and guide us even in a process so complicated as dating, which there is no easy formula. It's risky, it's difficult, but that's because God allows it to be that way because he wants to sharpen us and develop us and make us wise and make us compassionate and ultimately make us good partners, friends, mothers, fathers, and children. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, by the way, I have some products out in the foyer. In fact, I should probably show you what I have, but I didn't bring anything up here. Um, Allison Brooke has CDs. She didn't bring them with her, but she has a website alisonbrook.com and you can order them, right? Or if you're young, you can download iTunes and what else? Spotify. Spotify. iTunes. Spotify is like free. What's that? Apple Music. All the things. She's, she's downloadable, guys. So let's, uh, let's close off here. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your love toward us while we were yet sinners. While we were enemies in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And we praise you for that, God. We want to focus on that love because we want it to fill us and inform us moving forward. So please bless us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen.